Let's stand together and sing. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. Oh, He who hear now to His temple draw near, join me in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord, who o'er all things so wondrously reigns. Shelters thee under his wings, yea, so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how thy desires have been granted in what he ordained? Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder on you what the Almighty can do if with his love be befriend thee. Praise to the Lord should have given two Emmy Awards for outstanding acting for every single episode broadcast of Perry Mason. I think they should have given an Emmy Award for outstanding acting for Perry's client for the week who had to act as if they thought they were really in jeopardy of going to prison. <laughs> but even more, they should have given an Emmy Award for, I mean, just outstanding acting to poor Mr. Berger every week. <laughs> because he had to act every week as if this was the case he was going to win. When we knew he was going to lose just like he lost all the others before. To have Perry Mason as your defender was a guarantee you would get off somehow, some way. Well, if television could do that with a fictional character, just imagine what it's like to have, as we sung a few moments ago, the Lord God is our defender. Surely he doth daily defend thee. Before him, in his presence, there is no challenge to you that he cannot overcome. To quote an ancient Hebrew expression, wow, that's pretty neat. 
We're delighted to have with us today Dr. Enda Lee. I see you back there. Would you please come, Dr. Lee, and join me here on the platform to lead us in a word of prayer? Dr. Endo Lee was for many years a member of our faculty at Level College. We are delighted to have him back on campus any occasion that brings him back this way. Uh, he has served not only as a seminary professor, but as a chaplain in the National Guard and the Marine Reserves, I believe. And we're delighted to have one of our real military heroes, as well as one of our good friends here on campus. And a good reminder as he leads us in prayer. For all of us to continue praying day by day for not only our troops who are in Iraq and Afghanistan, but for those who have been called as chaplains to be out on the lines with them. Dr. Lee himself spent about nine months uh, in Iraq uh, serving with our troops. Would you please come and lead us in a word of prayer? Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, we thank you for this place that you have consecrated for your kingdom purposes. We thank you for the many that are part of Kingdom Pass that have come through these doorways and have sat in these places and now look down from heaven itself to watch how we serve and demonstrate our faithfulness. May you find us faithful today in this hour as we worship you, as we listen attentive to your word, as we seek to fulfill the ministry that you have set before us. Thank you for the leadership here in this place and for their devotion to this institution and for the students who continue to come responding to your love and to your gracious permission to serve you. I ask that you would bless each heart here today. Lord, I also pause to pray for those who are in harm's way around the world seeking to preserve our freedom so we can have these very kind of gatherings. While I pray for Jay Hearn today, who's serving with the U.S. Army as a chaplain in Cal Sioux. I pray for Brad Tom, who is serving in Fallujah, a place where I stood just a couple of years ago now, is continuing the ministry to our service members, God. Watch over them and care for them. And now, Lord, I pray for Don, your servant who has been given this appointed time, to break the bread of life before us. Use it to nurture our souls. Use it to refresh us and strengthen us for what you have called us out to do in this day. And may now, this moment, God, be savored by you as a wonderful blessing that rises up and fills your nostrils. We pray all this now in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Before you sit down, turn to somebody next to you, shake a hand or two, and just remind them, You're going to win this case. Would you do that? Thank you so very much. We are delighted to have you with us this day for a time of worship and praise on the campus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. V.L. Stanfield was a great professor of preaching here at New Orleans Seminary for many, many years. And he had a wonderful definition of preaching. He said, preaching is giving the Bible a voice. And that's what pastors ought to do week by week, opening the Word of God, preaching expository messages that reveal God's Word and give that Bible a voice to the present day and age. Every year in his honor, we have the Stanfield Lectures on Preaching. This year, we're having a one-day lecture with Dr. Don Wilton, who's the pastor of First Baptist Church of Spartanburg, South Carolina. That church is the largest church in the South Carolina Convention. They perennially lead the convention in cooperative program giving, which is what pays about half of your expenses, students, here at the seminary. So we love Dr. Wilton. Thank you so much for that support of the cooperative program. But more than that, they also are a great evangelistic church, and Dr. Wilton has had that experience of going to a plateaued uh, church and going through all the uh, controversy and difficulty involved in turning the church around and getting the church refocused on the Great Commission and becoming a Great Commission community within its city. He's done that. He's got all sorts of stories uh, to tell along the way, but central to everything that he did 
was the proclamation of the Word of God. He has always done that with great power and great effect. He taught for many years uh, on our faculty as a professor of evangelistic preaching. He's very popular as a preacher for revivals and crusades, and indeed could spend the rest of his life doing crusade after crusade uh, in evangelism because of the great power and impact of his preaching. We are so honored to have him here today, but of course the only thing that really matters about Dr. Wilton now to our seminary family is not that he's a great pastor and doing a great work and not that he's a wonderful preacher or not that he's a former member of our faculty. The really important thing is that he is the father of Greg and Rob Wilton and that he is the husband of Karen Wilton. And we're delighted to have Greg and Rob here as students on our campus and delighted that Karen could be with us today as well. We are also delighted to have as a special guest with us today a mission team from Lifeway Christian Resources. And they have come to assist Metairie Baptist Church in an evangelistic block party coming up. Uh, would you folks stand, please, and let us recognize you and say thanks. There you are right here for coming to help our city. Students, I want you to remember this for the rest of your lives because I want you to reflect having seen and witnessed this for the rest of your ministry and the way you do ministry. There has not failed a week since the winds died down after Hurricane Katrina and the levees broke and the city was flooded. There has not failed a week when there have not been Southern Baptists of one sort or of another from all over the nation working here in our city as well as along the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And everybody at every level of Southern Baptist life has done that, including all of the other entities and seminaries, and even these employees now of Lifeway who are here. Let us remember what recipients of grace we have been in the midst of this experience. God's teaching us that we need to be grace givers to others in times of need. Now let's turn our hearts toward another time of worship and prepare for a message from the Word of God.
back on campus and to have this time of fellowship with so many people that I love in a place that probably means as much to Karen and I as any place on the face of the earth. And uh, thank you, Dr. Kelly, for allowing me to be here today. We've had a wonderful visit again and uh, feel most privileged indeed. We did go to the Saints game on Monday night. And I promise you the saints are going to go to the Super Bowl in the next 50 years. <laughs> and I remember well the days with the paper bags on our heads and I'm just wondering about this season. But uh, I tell you, I love the city of New Orleans and especially this campus because God used the men and women on this campus to set me on a course that has been nothing but an absolute joy and a blessing in my own life. And I am eternally grateful to the Lord for that. So for Karen and I to be here is, a, is just a privilege. And then to be with our sons, Rob and Greg, and our precious daughter-in-law, Annabeth, and to be able to uh, just watch and see what God is doing through Ignite Mission uh, here in the city, uh, to see how God is moving amongst people and to watch at all that he is doing through the lives of individual people as they pass through these hallowed halls. I was privileged to be in a systematic theology class for an hour and a half with Paige Brooks just a moment ago. and I was just looking upon the faces of those men and women and once again I, I was just reminded of just what God does when he calls each one of us into the gospel ministry. And what a special thing that is. I want to start out by making a statement today, and that is that I have been praying for you in a very, very special way. Today's message is going to be a real threat to some people. Uh, somebody out here is going to feel awfully uncomfortable. Someone here today is probably going to be as deeply challenged as I have been, as I have studied this particular passage and have come to understand that God is not playing games with me. I'm going to pray for you in a very special way. I'm asking that the Lord would hide me behind the cross. Because this is not about Don Wilton. I believe that the things of which we speak in the next few moments are so fundamental to the preaching and teaching of the Word of God that without them, we're in serious trouble. And some of you... And some of us are trying to be ministers of the gospel. And we've actually gotten to the point at which we believe that we can do these things despite what the Lord Jesus had to say about them. Some of us have gotten so busy that they've slipped onto the back burner. We do not leave these things out of our lives because of intention. They just simply pass us by. 
I want to say to you that in the 15 years that I've been gone from New Orleans, I've come to understand that there is a tremendous, wonderful, ecstatic joy at the privilege of serving the Lord as the pastor of a local congregation. And I'm very grateful that God has given me this opportunity. But I'm also going to say to you that it's jolly hard work. I'm going to say to you that it's a battleground. And I want to share with you from my heart that if you're not prepared and understand some of the things that God would have us to do, you're going to become a walking disaster. And you could even become one of those people who actually ends up destroying a church instead of building it up. Now, I know that's a hard thing to say, but it's true. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about our people, and we ought to. And nobody understands the battle zones of life as much as you and I. We, we understand that. We understand the difficulty of individual personalities. Uh, we understand the rigors and the demands of the ministry. We understand many of the challenges, the battles that some of us don't want to talk about. We, we understand what it is to live in an aquarium as ministers, fishbowl, with everybody looking and watching and pointing fingers. But folks, we rarely, when it comes to preaching and teaching of the gospel, are we willing to sit down and actually take a hard look at ourselves. I want to speak to you this morning about three essential spiritual disciplines. And before I ask you to look with me in the Bible, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. You might want to turn there with me. We're going to be in the book of Matthew in chapter 6. And contextually, we know that uh, the Lord Jesus had gathered together a group of people. And we find that uh, he was giving to them some of the most salient and pertinent doctrinal statements that could ever be given. He was speaking, by the way, to those who would believe upon his name. He was charging them. There is a parallel connectedness between what Jesus had to say and those things that we find recorded for us, for example, in the pastoral epistles, where we read those wonderful statements that we talk about many times at ordination services. Preach the word. Be prepared instant, in season and out of season. But when Jesus spoke the Sermon on the Mount, he incorporated into the fabric of this most incredible sermon, if you please, and you know I don't like that term. This was rather a message from the heart of God himself. But it was constructed in a way in which you and I, if we listen to it carefully, we're going to understand in a fresh way that God was speaking directly into the hearts of all those that would believe on his name, and particularly those who are charged with the responsibility of teaching others. Uh, just the other day, in fact, Saturday a week ago, beautiful day, Dr. Kelly up in South Carolina, despite the fact we need water so badly, and uh, we woke up and I had had a very busy week. This was my only morning that I hadn't had to get up and go off to something, and so I was looking forward to getting out on the deck and uh, just sitting there and having a good cup of tea and minding my own business and and my wife turned to me. Now, you're not going to believe this. She turned to me right there. This is about 9 o'clock in the morning. I mean, I'm still in my pajamas, really. She says, listen, let's go for a walk. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Go for a walk? On a day like this? I, I want to be perfectly honest with you and tell you that that was probably the last thing that I wanted to do. It didn't suit me. I wanted to sit there and have something decent to eat, mind my own business, 
have some time off. I had earned the right. And my wife looked at me and she said, let's go for a walk. And so with great reluctance, especially considering the perfect specimen that I am, I said to her, well, let's go. So we put on our walking shoes there and we went out into the neighborhood and we walked and we walked. And I'm telling you, we walked. I mean, even for a man of my caliber. This is a Saturday morning, it's beautiful, and I should be sitting down eating biscuits and gravy. (laughs) And folks, we've been walking for an entire hour. And my wife says to me, we're going to go back up that road. I said, no, we're not. I said, we're going home. She said, we're going up that road. I said, we've been walking for a whole hour. I said, I need to go home. No, we're going up that road. And with great reluctance, again, I turn and walk another 5,332 miles. <laughs> well, we got back home and sat down. Now, here's the part that I'm about to tell you. I was very reluctant in what I did. But when I did it, I was glad that I had. Preaching and teaching the Word of God is the most consuming, demanding activity that you can possibly engage in. Here I am on a Wednesday and I told the theology class a moment ago, don't kid yourselves, folks, when I woke up this morning on this campus, I was thinking about Sunday. I pastored this church, I'm in my 15th year, those Sundays and Wednesdays and other nights and Sunday nights and special occasions, they roll around like you can't imagine. I get out of, we have three morning worship services on Sunday morning and I get home about 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock, and I'm telling you, before I've sat down, here comes Sunday again. Never gets away from it. I can never get away from it. It's like a roller coaster ride. It is non-stop. It's just there all the time. Those people are out there all the time. There are meetings all the time. There are people to lead to Jesus Christ all the time. It is non-stop. It is relentless. It goes on morning, noon, and night. And if you're not careful, you'll begin to cultivate a mindset that determines that you've earned the right to just sit down. I'm going to submit to you today that when you minister the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that if we understand what Jesus was teaching us here in the Sermon on the Mount, that amongst many others... I'm going to share with you very briefly today, very briefly, three essential spiritual exercises that you must do. Here they are. Let me give them to you. Number one, giving. Number two, prayer. Number three, fasting. Now, I've heard some people called fasting, fasting. It's the same thing. I just want to let you know. I've tried to teach Dr. O.J. to say fasting for years and it'll never work. There are some things that are beyond hope. If you'll read with me in Matthew and the sixth chapter, I want to read to you just a few excerpts beginning at verse 3. This is what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. He said, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. And I assure you they've got their reward. I I just want to stop there. If I was in my pastoral ministry now, I would spend a lot of time on that. If there is anybody in this world who has the opportunity to be seen of men, it's you and me. Jesus was saying to us, I declare that invalid.
But when you pray, go into your private room and shut your door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't babble like the idolaters, since they imagine they will be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, because your Father knows the things that you need, even before you ask of Him. And then He launches into this marvelous doctrinal statement. When he teaches us in the Lord's Prayer, I spent several weeks doing a thorough exegesis of that not too long ago. Pick up there when you're in verse 16. Whenever you fast, don't be sad-faced like the hypocrites. By the way, the word whenever literally means whenever. It literally means as you fast. On every occasion that you do what I'm instructing you to do. Jesus was not giving to us an option. He wasn't looking into my heart and saying to me, Pastor, I want to give you something that you might want to consider periodically. For they make their faces unattractive so that their fast is obvious to the people. I assure you they've got their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that you don't show your fasting to people, but to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. There are three spiritual disciplines. By the way, our church fathers refer to these as disciplines. I did not and don't refer these to these as disciplines because as soon as you use the word discipline, many people switch off. They are spiritual exercises, but they are disciplines. A discipline is that which you and I know that we need to do because it's good for us. A discipline is something that I do and because I know that if I do without it, I cannot do what I need to do. Paul, writing in 2 Timothy chapter 1, looked into the heart of Timothy and he said to him, Timothy, I want you to know that unless you stir up the gift that is in you, you cannot have a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of self Discipline. In fact, if you're not willing to stir up the giftedness that I've put in you and the means that I've placed at your disposal, you will be sentenced to a life of timidity, weakness and ineffectiveness. You will be rendered helpless and hopeless and wanting. You'll find yourself unable to make the relevant connectedness between your theology, that which you know, and the people to whom you speak. The prime responsibility of the preacher of God is to take God's word based upon the conviction of that which we know to be true about God and translate that in a practical relevancy into the hearts of men, women, boys and girls. It is not going to happen if you don't practice these disciplines. Well, let's just look at them, and if you'll beg my pardon, we're going to be very brief at looking at them, because they're massive subjects. For those of you that are pastors of churches, this is a six weeks, ten weeks sermon series. I'm trying to do it in ten, fifteen minutes. Number one, giving. I want to say something to you with all the love in my heart. When Jesus spoke about giving, folks... In verse 3, he said, But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Are you a giver? Now, guys, watch me, ladies and gentlemen. Are you a giver? When Jesus gave us these disciplines, he was incorporating that wonderful principle of the Word of God that if you sow generously, you'll reap generously. That wonderful principle that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And the greatest irony, if I may say this with all of my the love in my heart, is that the most selfish people in the world are ministers of the gospel. We have cultivated a handout mentality in our ranks.
When lost did you buy someone else a Coke? When lost did you stand in line at the seminary cafeteria and actually buy somebody else a meal? Or was it too much for you to do? Right behind this chapel, (laughs) there's some little apartments there. They are flat out awful. We arrived on this campus, some of the guys here will remember, we arrived, Karen and I, with two suitcases, and and we didn't have anything, man. We had nothing, and so we were awarded. It was the most magnificent thing in my life. I mean, we had both had a beautiful home, that we, apartment we lived in, and motorbikes and motorcars. We came to New Orleans, we were awarded an efficiency apartment. <laughs> it came with roaches and everything. It was like, It was like a whole package deal. <laughs> and we moved in there. It was unbelievable, folks. Right here. I'm talking about right, boom, poof, poof, right back here. It had one room. It had a big old closet in it, and it had a little kitchen. It had a pull-out bed. You had to pull this thing out. When you slept on this thing, Benji, the bed was like this. You woke up in the morning, you looked like a constipated camel. <laughs> We woke up one morning here, Dr. Kelly, it was a Monday morning, and we were as broke as broke could possibly be. I mean, we were just broke. We, there was a little donut shop across the road here, you remember, and we didn't have enough. Mike State, I'm telling you, that brother there, can, we painted everything on this campus, didn't we, brother Mike? Painted everything, bone white, we did it all. And I'm telling you, we couldn't go over to that other side of the road to get a donut. We had nothing. We had nothing. Nothing. Didn't have any money. Nothing. About 11.30 on that Monday morning, on my door, I opened it. Here's this man speaking in a Mississippi accent. I could hardly understand him. And he said to me, are you Don Wilton? I said, yes. He said, Chester Vaughan, program director of the Mississippi Baptist Convention, told us about you and we're in New Orleans. We wondered if we could take you and your wife out to lunch. I said, where's your motor car? (laughs) We got in that thing. We went out to East New Orleans. They had a steakhouse there. I still remember, brother, I ordered the number nine gun smoke. It was the whole half side of a car. (laughs) Man, we had this great meal, came back to campus. When he shook my hand, there was something in my hand. I looked in my hand. You know what he gave me, folks? He gave me a hundred dollars. Never forget it. It may not impress some of you, but I'm telling you, that was like a million dollars to me. I went up that steps, I said to her, I said, Duckling, you'll never guess what this man gave us. He, look at this, a hundred dollars. We went from flat broke to a full tummy and a hundred dollars to boot on top of that. My wife looked at me, she said, good. She said, then we've been given money to give to that couple we met that live in Willingham. I said, what are you talking about, woman? (laughs) She said, well, God's given us that money to give to that couple there. I said, you've got to be kidding me, and what do you know about the ministry anyway? (laughs) I said, this is morally wrong. She said, we're giving it to that couple. Well, I tell you, we went toddling on down the steps, went across to Willingham, put it in an unmarked envelope, slipped it. We had met this couple. A day or two before, they were just devastated. They had nothing. They were living in Willingham. Equally awful. (laughs) And we walked back. Now I'm broke again. I said, you know, God does this for me and my wife forces me to give it all away. (laughs) Folks, Karen's sitting there. We walked back into our apartment, Dr. Kelly. When I opened the door of that little efficiency apartment, there was an envelope under my door. I said, look, there's an envelope. Picked it up, opened it up, folks. There was $200 in that envelope. So you think God's called you to preach, has he?
Jesus here was talking about a spiritual discipline. A spiritual discipline that will bless you in ways that you can't begin to imagine. What kind of blessing? What does he demand? He demands that, that we be genuine in our giving. He demands sacrificial giving. I love that passage in Second Samuel 24, 24, where the king says, No, I am not going to give to the Lord my God unless it costs me something. Now, I'm asking a very personal question today. Are you giving to the point at which it costs you something? That it actually hurts you. You're having to forfeit. You're wondering, how can I do this? If I do this, I'm dead. I don't have it. But I'm going to do it anyway. And people might say, well, pastor, what does that mean? How does that translate into the preaching and teaching of the Word? This is a preaching lecture series. I knew Dr. V. L. Stanfield personally. I thought we were going to talk about preaching. We are. Preaching doesn't take place in the pulpit. It takes place in your pocketbook. When last did you buy someone else a Coke? Some of you guys are so tight you squeak even when you walk. You're holding on to everything. And there is a law that governs what God is teaching us about this spiritual discipline. He said, give and it will be given to you. God's word says, I'll put it back so much in your lap, you won't be able to stand it. He'll fill you with life with unspeakable joy. Mike Staten and I were on the paint crew here at the, and he remembers this so well. We had a man who worked with us, and he was just poverty stricken. I preached a revival up in Alabama. Remember that, Mike? Got through that revival, got an honorarium for $800. Saw a car parked in a driveway there. My wife will tell you. She remembers it too well. So I walked over the road and said, would you sell me this car? He said, well, I want $1,500. I said, listen, man, that little church at Green Hill, Alabama just gave me $800. I'll give you $800 for that car. He said, done deal. Jumped in it, came all the way down here, got back onto campus. Finally had a motor car to drive around in. My wife said to me, boy, she's messed me up so many times, it's not. She said, well, you need to give that to Mike. We called him the water buffalo. He was a precious man to us. And I remember the day that I took the car that I just bought with the honorarium that I'd just been given and I just gave it to a student who was working in the paint crew on this campus. Now some of you are going to look at me and you're going to say to me, Pastor, why are you, are you trying to impress us? No, my brother. How are you doing? Folks, the truth is, most of us go to our churches and wait for handouts. We're looking for everybody else to buy us this and to do that and to do the next thing. And we say, what has this got to do with the way I lead worship and the way I sing and the way I lead those children and the way I administrate the church and the way I preach the Word of God? It's got everything because it's a primary spiritual discipline. It is the hardest lesson of my life. Number two, prayer. Uh, folks, if you'll beg my pardon, I'm, I, I just cannot spend, I just want to say to you that if there is anything in my life that I battle with, it's my own private prayer life, Dr. Kelly. I, I would say that very openly, very honestly. And I can tell you one of the problems that I have as a pastor is I'm always praying. Now, does that sound like a contradiction? Everywhere I go, I'm praying with people, and God bless you, brother, and Lord, would you take care of this person? Pastor, would you pray? And we get thousands upon thousands. We've had 13,000 prayer requests over television just in the last couple of weeks. We're 
always praying with people. But folks, what Jesus was saying, it's not about your public prayer. The spiritual discipline is your private prayer. It's the consistency with which you pray. And one of my greatest struggles as a pastor is to be, to borrow a phrase, to be prayed up. I can't tell you what it does to me when I get in the pulpit and I feel as though I've been having a conversation with my Lord. I've been having a conversation. Because when I have a conversation with Him, I feel as though He's talking back to me much more than I can talk to Him. And Jesus establishes that mandate. And you know what I find out, folks? I find out that God, I'm a, I'm a man that has to have a spiritual harness on me. I've got to be restrained. I've got to be restrained because of my temperament. Because of the life that I've led. I grew up in Africa and went through experiences and things that... You gradually, over the years, you cult it. You, you have a certain temperament about you. And I'm telling you, within me, I am a walking disaster. Because of my temperament. And we all have temperaments and personalities. My temperament is, you know, is to, you know, all the things that you say, folks, you can get up there and be bold and preach and shoot straight. But how you say it is so very important. And my greatest weakness is there are many times I get in the pulpit and I speak the truth. And I'm telling people like it is. But I'm doing it within the context of Don Wilton's temperament. And when I do it in the context of Don Wilton's temperament it actually has a reverse effect. People switch off. They don't want to hear. And so how do I counteract that? Jesus said, you better understand, big boy, it's not about how many people out there are impressed by your pastoral prayer. Now that's a discipline for me, folks. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I, please forgive me, faculty, I'm not one of these people who rolls out of bed at five o'clock in the morning and automatically falls to my knees. And I'm not one of these people who believes that you can, you, the only time you're spiritual is if you have a, a, a quiet time at 5 a.m. in the morning. In my house, I am having a quiet time at 5 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> And so I struggle. I don't, I'm not one of these people who just sealy posturepedic and the Maxwell House and the community dark roast is on and get up and hoop de doo well I'm just going to have a nice devotion here. It doesn't come naturally to me, folks. I have to fight it all the time. I've got friends always walking around with this fella in their hand and going through this thing and they having this devotional and this quiet time. Well, I'm sorry, I battle with that. It is a constant battle for me. So what is it for me when Jesus says, you better get on your knees and get into your closet? That is a spiritual discipline. It's a discipline. I have to ask God to help me. And when I ask Him to help me, He enables me and He speaks to me and He puts His spiritual restraints on me. He harnesses me. And then there's one more, and I close with it. The matter of fasting. Huge subject, folks. Go and do a study on it. Jesus, here in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 16, he didn't say, if you fast, he said, when you fast. And if he said, when you fast, I want to know when I'm supposed to fast, don't you? Well, go and do a study, folks. Bible, there's so many. I just give you six, very quickly. Just write them down. Six occasions that the Bible teaches that you fast. Number one, during times of sorrow. Bible's clear. Go to Second Samuel. Go and read about what David did when Abner died. Are you going to say to me, well, does a pastor ever have times of sorrow? Every day.
personally, corporately, ministerially, every day. Folks, people are going through the worst kinds of sorrow. People say, how do you help someone with grief? Teach them to go on a fast. One day, one meal, two days, seven days. Be like Jesus. Go on a 40-day fast. That's between you and the Lord. Fasting's not about losing weight, folks. It's not a diet plan. But you will lose weight because fasting means that you are saying no to food in favor of meeting with the Lord. So you are going to lose weight depending on how long you fast. Don't go from the sublime to the ridiculous. Don't go overboard in things. Jesus didn't say that. He didn't say unless you fast for 40 days, you cannot be spirit. Jesus never once said that. He said fast. That's between you and the Lord. Number two, during times of opposition. Psalmist in Psalm 35, David speaks about it repeatedly throughout the scriptures. Go and study the great prophets. Here comes the opposition. They called for a time of fasting. You might say to me, preacher, do you ever have any opposition as a preacher, as a minister? Folks, our life, we go from one moment and person of opposition to the next. Can't imagine the opposition this campus has faced. Number three, during times of great danger. Second Chronicles 20, the wonderful story of King Jehoshaphat. Here comes this great army. They couldn't do anything about it. They were overwhelmed. And Jehoshaphat said, let's go and let's fast. Times of great danger. One of the greatest mistakes I made, and I've apologized to my congregation. I apologized to them. Ask them to forgive me. When 9-11 occurred, folks, I did not call my church to a time of fasting. I apologized to them. I said, I let you down. Parents know what it is to be confronted by danger. When you send your sons and daughters off to college and they're on that highway, Number four, during times of penitence, 1 Kings 21, Elijah confronted Ahab about his sin. What does the Bible say? He tore his clothes and he fasted. Penitence. Anyone here need to confess your sin before the Lord? Say, wait a minute, pastor, what are you talking about? Is there anybody here who's been sinning against God? Confession, absolutely. Repentance, absolutely. Jesus said it's a time when you fast. You want to deal with that, go into a time of fasting. Number five, during times of conviction. I love that. I love love some of these great passages of Scripture, folks. Daniel chapter 9, for example, where Daniel says he understood the Scripture according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah. And when he became convicted about the word of the living God, he fasted. In our theology class this morning, we were talking about conviction. What God is saying to me here is, Pastor, long before you get into that pulpit, because you believe in the Word of God and you understand who God is, you understand in the power of the cross and nothing but the blood of Jesus, you need to fast. Fasting and conviction. But there's one other, number six, during times of great anticipation. Great anticipation. Oh, think about Acts chapter 13. The inauguration of the New Testament church. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Go ahead and set Barnabas apart. Barnabas apart for the work to which I've called them, he and Saul. Watch this. So after they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on. By the way, listen to this. You can pray without fasting. But you cannot fast without praying. You can pray without fasting, but you cannot fast without praying. The Bible talks about ministry anticipation. Folks, all of our ministry is a ministry of anticipation. It's, it's a great expectation of the power and the presence of God. Take the life of the Lord Jesus himself. Before Jesus went out preaching... He fasted and prayed for 40 days. Then he went out preaching. I'm the pastor of a local church and 
And here we are as a people and we're asking God, would you do for us? We're going to, to our people and to our leadership and we're saying God is speaking to us. You have a beautiful campus like this and, and you're anticipating we need this building over here. We need to complete this construction. We need, we need to inaugurate this ministry here. We need to go to this new level. God's word says ministry anticipation is a wonderful time to fast. Would it not be incredible if every student on this campus, every person in my church, all the ministers on my staff, that we determined to fast in the presence of the Lord? What is Jesus saying to us? There are three spiritual disciplines here that I cannot do without. And discipline is that which I must do because my life without it is worthless. And when it comes to the fact that the Lord Jesus has called me into the gospel ministry, and I look out here today across as I see moms and dads and friends and neighbors, people, you are precious people and you're serving the Lord. And when you think about all the things that come down upon our hearts and, and the dreams and the aspirations and the places and the grief that we go through and the loss and the hurt and the pain and the opposition and the anticipation and expectation. And we ask, Lord, what must we do? I know one thing, and that is that the Lord's been speaking to my own heart. I'm asking the Lord to refresh my heart. I'm asking the Lord to help me to be a far more worth in His hands as His instrument. I want to be more of a blessing. I want to reach more people for Jesus Christ. I want my life to count for something. I want my sons and my daughters to, to look into my life when all is said and done and say, you know, Dad, walk with the Lord. What was it about, folks? It's not... It's not about the size of a church or, or, or the degrees or where you stand or what you do or who says this and what walk road. Folks, these are the things that are so deep because God, God gets a hold of your life and he, he will just draw you from inside out. And he will bring, bring to bear on, in, and through your life the sweetest expression of his grace. And God will bless you. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Just for just a moment here. Just before we have our final prayer, before we leave. Just wonder if there's anyone here today you'd say, Brother Don, you know, I know that God has called me. But I, I want to be a man and a lady disciplined in the disciplines that God expects of me. I, I want to be somebody who is driven, moved, and motivated by the Spirit of the living God. I want you to just pray with me today. Ask God to do something for me that I cannot do for myself. My, my precious brother or sister, is there, is there someone here today that you've just run dry? You, you, you're running out of juice. You're worn out. <laughs> you're growing weary and well-doing. You're beating that pathway down the road and you're organizing and administrating and preaching and balancing your private life and your home life and you've got more questions than you've got answers and you're just even wondering what you're doing in chapel. Even coming to chapel is a chore. It's not a matter of just going to chapel. Quite frankly, you'd rather be sitting there having a cup of coffee because you're just exhausted. You give out. You're running out of juice. Is God just speaking to you about three things today? Are you giving? And folks, it, it's not about equal giving. It's about equal sacrifice. It's not about a dollar amount. <laughs> God
God just doesn't want us to think we can give him a tip and get away with it. He doesn't accept tips. It's about equal sacrifice. Are you giving? Are you giving of your talents and your tithes? Are you honoring the Lord with your possessions? Is it your prayer life, perhaps? Perhaps you're like me and you you just, this is the biggest battlefield of your life and you know what you need to do. Are you willing to just lay it all before the Lord? Maybe it's this area of fasting. You don't hear a lot of messages on fasting. It's a spiritual discipline. Maybe the Lord has just put in your heart to miss a meal this week. Instead of going to lunch, go to this room somewhere and just have an hour talking to the Lord. Whatever God put, he just said, when you do it. Maybe the circumstances of your life are driving that. Maybe you're praying about a ministry opportunity. Maybe you're one of these brothers and sisters that you, you're, you're being hammered down where you are. And it's tough and it's hard. And Father, in this place today, I join together with these brothers and sisters, for we are all engaged in that to which you've called us to. Father, it is such a joy to serve you. And we would readily confess to you today that our lives are so busy and tired up. We face so many things in our hearts and lives, but you speak to us. You refresh our hearts. You give us the means by which we can stand up and serve you with a whole heart and a good heart and a contented heart. Lord, I pray that today, as you do day without end in this place, that your spirit would permeate our souls, that we would rise up together and be counted for righteousness, that we would not settle for the levels of mediocrity, and that even in our pain and hurt, that we might know that you are God. Father, today we come to affirm who you are, for there is none like unto thee. And we pray, our Father, that you would part ourselves and one another with your most gracious blessing as we pray these things together. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. God bless you.